Hello, everybody. Yes, we're still at the hotel I, tango. I, I kind of <laughs> want to do a four, three. We're back. <laughs> we haven't left. We're still at the hotel. <laughs> and so we still have our whiskey. So welcome to another edition of On the Rocks. Collaboration between Robert's camera and Luminous Landscape. And uh, today we have two barrels full of cameras. <laughs> That's, and we're going to talk about formats today. And with me, Phil Gibson and Jody Grover from Robert's camera. So, to start this out, there are a lot of choices these days, and these two guys are pretty much the experts because people come in to see them all the time, usually with the question that I usually get in emails, what camera should I get? Bottom line is, there's a lot of choices. So we have, uh, and we're talking specifically not so much which camera to buy, but the format size of the sensor to talk about. And we have Micro Four Thirds, APS-C, full frame, Full frame, you mean eight by 10? No, full frame. Oh, okay. Full okay. frame. Full frame, 35, like 35 millimeter, 35, full frame. 24. Yeah, that's full okay. frame, okay? okay. okay. Then it. there's this medium format, which is a 645, and then there's this thing in between, which Fuji likes to call the G size, or the G format, and it's the same one that uh, Hasselblad uses, which is a, a different size altogether, and I think Leica even has one that's a little bit smaller than all of those. So there's a lot of different choices, and of course, the question is, which way to go? And um, I thought I'd start off with Phil. And, and when somebody comes in and begins talking to you with all these choices we have, we've got the Canon full frame, we've got the Fuji APS-C, we've got the Sony APS-C, we've got the Fuji GFX, Nikon full frame, Olympus Micro Four Thirds, uh, another APS, uh, with, which one's that? Yes, That's APS. That's the new uh, Panasonic G9. Uh, G9, yeah. and that's... Um, Micro, Micro Four Thirds. Third. Yep. So yep. we got a lot of choices. Yep. So how, how do you? What happens? Tell us what you see. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on how large of a camera they want to carry around. I mean, that's kind of how large of a camera do they want to carry around, and are they going to print? And if they're going to print, how large of a print? You know, those are those are the questions. There's not as much printing happening these days, yep. so that can directly change what you want in a camera. You know, if if, if you want something small. Uh, it's always micro four thirds. I mean, it's tiny. Show us the Olympus. This is the M1 Mark II. I mean, this is the largest of their line, and it's still relatively small. Um, it's quick. What can track auto focus well? This is the 12 to 100. So I don't know that we have an equivalent. Well, yeah, it's not quite. Yeah. But <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so that's a 24 to 72.8. This is the 12 to 100 F. Four. That's 12 times 2 is 24. So it's a 24 to 200 equivalent. 200 equivalent, right, but right. look at the size difference, especially yeah, when we hold yeah, them up. It's a lot smaller. And yeah, yeah. a lot lighter, too. A lot lighter. A lot lighter. That's kind of where you start, unless someone comes in and tell you they want a Canon or an Icon or whatever, and then you sell it to them. But I mean, if they come in and they don't know what they want, you kind of start with that. How, so, how large of a camera do you want? You know, what and, do you want to carry around? What do they own? Yeah, Maybe. and yeah, yes, right. And that kind of comes along with it. If they come in looking for a Canon or an Nikon, you know, that's what they're going to buy. You know, there's no reason to try and talk about what they're going to buy. A lot of these people come in, they've never shot a camera before. You know, they mm -hmm. want to know what to buy. And everyone's told them to buy a Canon or an Nikon. Whoever is shooting Canon or Nikon, they send people in and they tell them that's what they want. And not that there's anything wrong with Canon or or Nikon. They make great cameras, but there's a lot of choices out there today. So, you know, the whole sales process has got to be uh, a, a big one. I mean, do, yeah. you, oh, do yeah. you go to a full frame 35 millimeter size right. or right. an APS-C size that, or right. micro four thirds? Right. Now, let's talk a little bit about sure. this camera because it's smaller is what's right. called a micro four thirds. Right. That's a four three ratio versus a three two ratio, right. which yeah. is what we see on a 35 millimeter, correct? 
Yes, thank you. Very good. Full frame. Being very polite. <laughs> Full frame. Full frame. So you know, you first off have got to kind of understand where we're going with that. This means a, a smaller sensor can't Correct. make as big a print. Is That's that a is that a fallacy or is it? A... Well, it depends on how big of a print we're talking. I mean, if you're going to make a 16 by 20 and you're not going to do a lot of cropping, this will work great. Yeah. You know, it depends on how large of a print you're going to do. And most people today, will, you know, they're getting cameras to take pictures and share on social media. That's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They're not printing. So it depends. It dep and, and I'm not saying that's their only customer. Yeah. But you got to find out. And if that's not the customer, this is not the camera for you. I mean, there's lots of other options, you know? So the next size up from Micro Four Thirds would be? APS-C. APS-C. And that's right. like, is that approximately half the size of a 35 millimeter kind of you know, cut a, a 35 millimeter cut in half a little bit. I but think it's a skosh more. A yeah, smaller. it's a little, little bit, a little bit. Longer. I think of it, we call it, it it's got, the, the Micro Four Thirds has a 2X factor, meaning if you buy a lens and it's 12 no. millimeters, it's My 20. My Canon was, the, the conversion was 1.6. 1.6. Right? When I had the 7D Mark II, that's a 1.6. The, the Nikon is a 1.5. Right. And right. so is uh, APS-C. Sony A6500 and so yeah. forth. So. Right, right, right. Now let's explain this so that those that don't know it, and there's probably a few out there that don't. The industry likes to look at the full frame, sorry, Jody, but you know, 35 millimeter proportion full frame right. as the standard for measuring the lenses. Right. So a normal lens would be the diagonal of the frame, which would be approximately 50 millimeter. Right. 40, yeah. No, well, approximately. 50, 48 is yep. to be more exact. So micro four thirds would be a 2X, 2x factor. Right. So uh, to get a 24 to 70, you would need a 12 to 35 right. lens. Right, that's correct. Okay, now there's some depth of field things that are going on in that's there and we're too. not here to yeah. talk and about that. That's another question to but ask. Right. Yeah, yeah, what that's, happens that's, is yeah. the smaller sensor allows for a larger depth of field right. versus a full frame correct. where you'll get more of a shallower depth of field and more of an out of focus background. Right. 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 So and now we go to APS-C, which is, you know, the next size up, and that's about a 1.5 factor, give or take 1.4, 1.6. 1.5 1. is so easy to calculate. Yeah, exactly. I don't even pay attention it's to close 1. to everything 6. else. So, so fast. Yeah, that's exactly. pretty much how APS-C size works. Right. Full frame is one to one. So if you're, you know, working with that and a full frame, this is a Sony, for example, full frame. Why don't you hold the Canon up so we can put that side by side? So this is a Sony uh, full frame mirrorless versus the the, the, the Canon. Yeah. And you can see there's quite a size and weight difference. Uh, this with mirror these. box. Oh. Yeah, it's a mirror box with a lot of mechanics in it. And the difference between, and we should make sure we explain this for those that don't understand it, a mirrorless camera doesn't have a mirror box. So right. typically in a DSLR, there's light comes in in a lens, reflects in a mirror, goes into a uh, finder, and you, that's, you're seeing right through the lens. Uh, you know, that's a, uh, an SLR, single lens reflex. You're using one lens to see. And D stands for... And it's only digital. focusing when the lens is down. Correct. <clears throat> now, Important point. That is when you take the picture, the camera, lens, the mirror flops up and the light goes through and hits the sensor. And of course, if something's moved at that time, you don't see it during that time and then the mirror flips down. If I'm using it, it's what's going through there is usually the, the back end of an animal. <laughs> or an antler. <laughs> or the tail end of a bird. Or a tail end of a bird. Actually, I was told that when you <laughs> photograph birds, you don't want to photograph birds. <laughs> well, you're a real bird photographer when you can get them coming head on. Okay. And we'll talk about that in our wildlife segment on how to photograph birds. <laughs> well, with that, I need another shot. <laughs> ah, there's so much we're going to learn as time goes on. <laughs> Should be good. And now as we move further on up uh, the ladder, uh, we come to this, which is, this is a GFX by Fuji. 50 megapixel. Yep. They call it a G size sensor or a G format, which because it's really not a medium format, so it's somewhere in between. Um, and it's a pretty cool camera, and it's doing some amazing uh, results. But it's 50 uh, megapixels with some fairly good size pixels. And there's another thing we need to talk about, and uh, maybe you, two of you can elaborate a little bit on that: is the size of the pixels. So, for example, Micro Four Thirds 24 megapixel camera. APS-C size, 24 megapixel, and a full frame like right. this, Sony, 24 megapixel. Same megapixels, right. but the s pixels are bigger. Right. And what does that do for us? More light, uh, better dynamic range usually. What, what, one thing that 
really fascinates me is the word has been five years ago and back, bigger pixels, better ISO, right. results, better dynamic range. It's logical. Pixel this big can't bring in as much light as a pixel right. this big. Right. And yet technology right. and algorithms and processors right. take a take that Olympus makes a huge difference. And take right. the and take and yeah. th that's, that's exactly right. It's not a it's Plus not you've got straight lenses made for the sensor anymore. It makes a huge there's, difference. There's lots of other yeah, things yeah. that are making these smaller pixel cameras right. better. Right. So we're myth busting along the way. We're myth yes. busting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it used to be you had to have a full frame camera to get the wide dynamic range. Absolutely. And to be able to print big. You had to. You had no choice. That's not the case anymore. I mean, it, it really isn't. And you know, there's there's so much you can do with raw processing. Now, um, I don't it, shoot raw because every shot I take is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you can leave your comments about that comment below. I'm a, I'm a thespian. <laughs> Cheers. Drink to that. <laughs> a thespian. Oh. But um, there is a JPEG which does all the processing of raw in the camera and then right. throws out the raw. Um, which is okay maybe for doing sports and things you need to be quick at. But what's happened now is between the sensors and the algorithms of raw processors, whether it be Capture One, Lightroom, uh, Raw One, or a number of different uh, processors that are out there, allow you through these things to recover details and shadows and highlights uh, unlike anything you've had before. It's, right. it's, it's, it's almost you know, scary. Pe people bemoan the loss of the darkroom. Yeah, and it's crazy. I just, it just that's crazy. No the dark room is right. bigger and better and more fun than it's ever been. True. And my dark room is, you know, my my computer. And when I had a real dark room, I had big Marantz stereo and Bose speakers and, you know, trays and chemicals and other things in there. They had Marantz in the 1800s? <laughs> in the 1800s. It was the 70s, man. Oh, the 70s. 70s. Oh. Do you remember that? Oh. Yeah. No, no, I don't. <laughs> that decade went by no. pretty quick, yeah, didn't it? Was, but, you know, it's funny, you know, we had all the, you know, to me, the fun part of photography is getting out there and taking the picture, and the other part is, you know, was getting in the dark room on a Sunday and spending the day listening to good music and, you know, making your prints in the trays, dodging and burning and, you know, evolving the print. Now I can still listen to my music on, you know, my stereo system on my, and I do it on my computer uh, in, in pure daylight. And the... the some of the techniques are the same. There's still dodging and there's burning and there's vignetting and things. The mathematics are the same. Yeah, you know, uh, essentially. But the capabilities of the latitude from white to dark and the ability to have so much detail and subtlety in a picture. It's amazing. It, it's it's amazing. Digital really has really improved amazing. photography yeah. when it comes it's to really that. really amazing. And of course, it, I'm curious, you got people coming back and getting film cameras too. Isn't there film seeing a resurgence at all? The other day, yeah. Yeah. I was out test taking a picture with a with a camera for one of our ads. I uh, needed a picture of from me to the camera. And one of the sales guys, Jared, comes out and starts photographing me with an FM2, I think. God, and, that was... and I, I start, you know, I'm a thespian. I start giving him some show. <laughs> and, sure, and sure enough, later on, I'd forgotten. I was mistaken thinking it's replacing. I'd forgotten how interesting black and white film was. Exactly. It's and a lot of fun. I was a, a lot of fun it was different. It is different. I didn't yeah. think it was different anymore, yeah. but it still, it still, it still was different. different. Yeah. It still it looks really different. Interesting. I mean, it's yeah. like playing vinyl yeah. versus, right. Right. you know, the exactly CDs right. and We digital. saw a lot of film. Yeah. Yep. We saw I a still, lot of film. I still yeah. crack out the A1 and shoot some black mm -hmm. and white. I mean, it's yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. We had a tiny camera store. We were a catalog showroom. And the camera store was what catalog showrooms. I used to work in a catalog showroom. Yeah, like Best or something sure. like that. And yeah. uh, I, f I was trying to think of what the first camera was. It was the early Canon, and Meredith thought it might have been the Minolta. Okay. Which, what was the name SRT? of the SRT? The SRT. Like 101 or something? I thought it was the maybe the AE1. Like you know? the early A1. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I don't know. Look those things up. We, we, we... A1's a great camera, though. Oh, my oh, God. My. Yeah, it's a, it was really you know, a camera for the time. People talk about the cameras, what we're talking about, the big chip, the little chip, the noise, the resolution, better resolution. I processed and reticulated my so, triax. Oh, I did that and by I, accident. And, and no one wants that. Sometimes I like certain cameras will have a better noise, which sometimes is a choice you make, like reticulating triax ones. 
It doesn't always have to be, yeah. oh my God, it has to look like 100 well, fil film was. I mean, it, it can have other feelings. It's funny. Right? Um, Capture One, for example, a couple years ago, because people like the, you know, they said it has to have a film look. And, you know, film look. So Capture One, Phase One, put grain now you can add green. green. So it's like, oh, and they they have some that are reticulated, which I mean, for it's reticulation is basically choice. we put yeah. cold in on top of hot and basically screwed up the film yeah, yeah. and reticulated it. Yeah. But, so, but you have your choice now of adding you know, grain back into it. For me, you know, it's like, I find it amazing where somebody takes a look at a 12,800 ISO image and goes, God, that's grainy and noisy. I said, dude, man, we used to get that at ISO 320. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you, don't, right? you don't have no clue. The fact that we're shooting at 12,800 with the quality yeah. that we've got, yeah. you know, for any of us that have shot film, we look at it and go, wow, man, that is pretty good. And there's good. a purpose. A lot of my pros, guy did a shot on the D5 with at every ISO all the way up to, what is it, 112,000? Yeah, something like that. 120,000. Yeah, because that, 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 yeah. we use that. I put 120,000. Yeah. I put it next to the same camera, a chart shot at uh, 400, 12,000. Can't tell them apart. Yeah. Yeah. And is that good for a certain professional that needs that in a dark? Yeah, but. Yeah, but I mean, they make such a big deal out of it now. That's become the new thing. It's not about megapixels, it's about ISO. And it's it like, should be about the image. What is the deal? No, it should yeah, be about the image. About yeah. the image. Yeah. But I, I suppose it depends on where somebody needs to go with it and yeah. what they're willing to sacrifice to have that image yeah. at that high ISO. Yeah. But the fact that uh, one of my techniques that I shoot with almost all of these cameras these days, and this is something we couldn't have done years ago, is uh, if I'm shooting wildlife, for example, birds and things, this might help you when you're shooting of birds, oh, okay? Goodness. I set, <laughs> take a note. <laughs> so I, I, sh I set my shutter speed to the shutter speed I want, whether it be 1,000, 1,200, or 1,500. And I set my f-stop, depending on the length of the lens and everything, to be appropriate. And I, then I use the auto ISO range. And so I let the auto ISO run between 100 to 12,800, right. and it automatically switches. So if I'm shooting in a bright and it goes against the wood, it's, you know, it, it's automatically doing it. And the exactly autofocus right. is still locking on, but I don't have to worry about the change of everything. Yeah, AF is be good. Fine. You know, I've got the yeah. right depth of field for what I want to shoot. Sometimes I like to shoot wide open to really narrow it down. Well, you're doing that they, correctly. Oh, she already knew about this. Yeah. <laughs> so watch and take notes. <laughs> I need another shot. <laughs> anyway, um, then there's some other freaky cameras that are coming out these days, like uh, this one. And um, we have a little video and review on this camera on the site, so uh, you can look at it. Uh, it's a little bizarre. This is the Light 16. Um, it is not a format. You can't define this camera. Um, it's got 10 lenses or something and a cool. 55, uh, a 50 plus megapixel uh, file that comes out of it, but there's no histogram and it's a lot of mathematics and uh, uh, there's a lot of things out of there. But uh, what's interesting, because we're talking a lot about the technology that comes into the sensors, is the fact that this company is taking 10 lenses and allows you to you know, have different depths of field because of the way each of one of these uh, sensors is photographing and then combines them in the final file. It's kind of uh, half-proven technology at this point, as far as I'm concerned. But there was a camera that came out that a traditional camera that had that technology. Lytro. Lytro you think? And Lytro was just bought, They're I done. Think, no, they're not. Oh, I think I Google they bought them Google. Just okay. this okay. week. Okay. So we double check it, but yeah. I think Lytro was bought by Google, okay. which means they're probably going to take that technology and, then and give it away. Well, either <laughs> give it to somebody, you know, but, you know, that's Google. <laughs> but, you know, Google's pretty, you know, I know a number of the guys at uh, Google Photos, and there's some really interesting guys, and they're working on a lot of interesting projects and technologies. Um, you know, one of the ones was Nick, and I wish they would have, you know, continued doing Boy, it. But Nick lucky for us, Nick was bought recently. Um, who bought them? Um, DxO. Know. DxO oh, bought okay. them. And they, I've seen the prototypes of it. And you know how they did the, um, the, the U point technology? Right, right. Well, the DxO's version of it is even better implemented. Oh, okay. So nice. uh, we'll start seeing that, so, I think, sometime soon. Google sold it to them? Who, uh, they sold it or, or gave it to gave them with an I mean, the agreement that they would anyway, develop so, it away. But yeah, yeah. so uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of that happens in this industry. Uh, you know, who buys who? Fred made $400 for <laughs> they gave it away. I mean, so that was cool. It's just one of those early adapters. <laughs> Wait long enough, it's free. No, he talked me into getting a certain. 
health watch for my wife. I yeah. bought it. Got bought up by the other company and closed a week later. How did that work? That's oh, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Well, so, uh, I'm here for you, buddy. So, I heard it's really good you came in two separate cars. <laughs> anyway, we've had a lot of fun talking about this. We could go on and on about all the film formats. Uh, I think in the bottom line of this, in the, in the end, uh, it's good when you have guys like Phil and Jody that you can call either Roberts and uh, ask for these guys, uh, they email them, uh, all the information will be below. And uh, if you have a question, ask. Uh, a lot of it has to do with your photography. They know a lot about all of this, that they can help you make the right choice for the size sensor that you want, as well as the different camera lines that are uh, available there. Uh, one other thing I'd like because to mention. Because the difference is, this is really incredibly important. Okay. Is that what Roberts does is going away. <clears throat> that you can call someone. It's true. And a human being answers the phone and you can get someone that will talk to you, tell you the truth, help you make a decision wherever you go to get your camera. We hope it's with us. But this is going away and yeah. you should treasure it before you miss it. To kind of talk one little thing about it, I got to know these guys is because I like visiting camera stores like some people like to visit hardware stores. And you can I ask- Which we liked when you came in. <laughs> well, you, I know on the PA system, <laughs> you have that security camera going, Ravers in the parking lot. <laughs> I come in and there's nobody Rock. around. <laughs> but you know, somehow or other, you still, even if you don't really like me, you make me feel sort of welcome when I get there. And that's something you don't find on the internet. <laughs> So the bottom line is I, I've talked a lot about Roberts. We uh, did an article about the 60th anniversary and how Roberts has evolved. And uh, you know there's a number of other camera stores, but their corner camera stores are going away. And, yeah, they really are. Um, you know, it's, Scary. it's a priceless experience to go in there and you know, decide you're going to buy a camera. And I buy a lot of gear from these guys because I know I can talk to him about it. I know I can say, put me on the list, and I'll be at the top of the list. I know no, I'll no, we do that straight by date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bottom line is, though, when they, they have a lot that most people are always out of because of the way they do things. And one of the things that I think is one of the standout parts about Roberts, and specifically when we talk about all these cameras, as new cameras come, old cameras go in to the used department because people trade in cameras. You can do that at Roberts. And you should see yeah. their used department. So if you're looking for a camera, uh, you don't have the budget to buy a brand new one, but you want to buy something of uh, technology, maybe it's just a year or two old, you'll find that. And film, you got film cameras too. You do. So if you want to go Inventory retro, changes every day. Yeah, so you go into the out. film camera. So it's a huge department, it goes way back. I mean, they got shelves and shelves of this stuff, stuff coming in. Um, it's a big business, but it's a bottom line, it's pretty cool. So if you're in Indianapolis, not only stop by and visit Roberts, but hey, you know, let me know you're coming and bring a bottle of whiskey and we'll get the three of us together <laughs> and drink with you. But it's all an experience and Indianapolis is a fun, city and I think you know we're a bunch of fun guys having a good time talking photography and Jody and Phil I want to thank you again for thank you. sitting with me and um, we got a lot Appreciate more it. to talk about in future episodes but I want to say thank you don't forget to subscribe use the bell button to be notified when new versions come out and I'll see you on the luminous landscape I drove because I don't like to be stuck and I'm afraid we would have an argument and I was going to have to leave. We were afraid, Phil.